Right, next up we have uh, someone special. She has experienced very interesting things, if I may say. Uh, Mrs. Lee Schoolen, she, uh, she's from the Acton Institute and she, she comes from, uh, she, she was born and raised in communist China and has uh, many horrendous stories to let you know. So, please. Thank you. Not like uh, uh, Ma Junjie, I have a very short introduction. So I'm going to introduce myself to you through my story. A survivor story. I'm a survivor of the communist dictatorship. I'm not a victim. I refuse to be a victim. There's a big difference between survivor and a victim. That's why I label myself the survivor. So, um, here is uh, my story began. I have to go back uh, more than 100 years ago for a good reason. This is my great grandfather, uh, Ma Junjie, just showed some pictures on the other side of him. Oops, sorry, too fast. Another great grandfather. My grand uncle and aunt. That's another important figure in Chinese history. This is a, a picture of my relatives with uh, General MacArthur in 1942 in the uh, Philippines. They're very good family friends. This is my family. Uh, the one sitting in the sofa, that's my great-grandmother with bounded feet, only this big. And uh, my parents on the left, my grandparents on the right, and the middle is my uncle. Uh, that's my parents' wedding picture in Shanghai. Oh, I'm sorry. This was me sitting in the chair and talking about my opinion uh, of um, Charles de Gaulle and uh, Macmillan at age four. <laughs> Just happened they were visiting Shanghai that time. The reason I was showing you all this is my as you can tell, those are just a few of my uh, ancestors. And um, they are the uh, emp empire of the modern of China. If you read any Ch modern Chinese history book before the communism, before 1949, especially in the sector of the capitalism, um, more than 50% of the people are related into my family. That caused a lot of trouble for me. So I was born as a black kid. Chinese government divided people into black and red. So because my ancestors, I was born black. They had nothing to do with me besides the blood. And their wealth were all taken away in 1950-51 by the Communist Party. Uh, Ma Junjie showed you a picture earlier, all nationalized. So I never enjoyed a penny of their wealth, and I didn't even meet them, most of them, some I met. And, uh, but I have to pay for their crime of being rich. So earlier today, a lot of people keep talking about rich, poor, rich, poor. Those are the very terrible labels people put on people, uh, other people. Those rich people, my ancestors, they're value providers. They're, they're creators, they're innovators. They changed Chinese history. They modernized China. They pro they open factories, banks, stores, uh, companies, and they provide jobs, opportunities, 
and uh, the market, everything. But the communists, Mao let the communists label them the rich, so they are the enemy of the people. They need to be condemned because it's not fair. Those people have more than some other people. So these kind of mentality is still exist today that kind of uh, bothers me. That's why I'm here telling my story. So. We all know this, and uh, as a black kid, I was never allowed to be one of these people. We were not allowed to dress like that, or have the red scarf, or the red armband, because we were black. And uh, the Chinese government divided people into five reds and five blacks. I don't know what the five reds, because not related to me. The five blacks are landowners, anti-communism, bad people, that's the funniest thing. Uh, the, oh, rich people, or landowners, rich people, uh, anti-revolutionary, anti -revolutionary. number four is the bad people, and uh, number five is the right, rightist. Sometimes we're joking recently, we said, you're number four. Everybody knew that means you're bad people. There's no definition, no, no reason. Just if I don't like you, you're bad. So you're number four. And uh, so we're uh, the black. And uh, this posture is famous known as uh, jet propulsion. They forcefully put your arms behind so you have to bow your head. In Chinese culture, if you bow to somebody, it means you're inferior. You, you, are, you have no honor. So the higher the raise your arm behind you, the lower your head will bow. So that's one thing they do to all the black people all the time. The black mostly are educated people, especially educated outside of China. And uh, uh, people has, who has knowledge, those uh, mostly had those kind of treatment. Of course, my parents. And um, this banner, the lower three character, that's person's name, top is his crime. His crime is black. Uh, belong to the black group. And what they're doing is to cut his hair. That what they do, want to do is to humiliate people to the max. So they will cut your hair uh, into yin yang style, they call it. Just cut one side and left the other side. And the other side and also cut randomly, so it was really messy. That's what my mother got from her students. She was a college professor. And uh, of course, she's educated. And her grandfather was so famous. And also, she was teaching English. That's enemy's language. Everything add together, she was condemned. So she had that treatment. What they did that time was give you a big uh, board with your name. This person is not that bad. If your name had right, uh, was written upside down, you're worse. That's to get determine the level of your sentence. If your name has a cross, black cross, you're w even worse. If your name has a red cross, you're on your way to the execution ground. So every day, my brother and I, among other kids, we go out secretly to look, see what happened to my mom's name. Either today is written this way, tomorrow if it's written upside down, we go something more serious, or oh, there's a cross on there, or there's a black cross or red cross on there. That's how we determine our faith. And um, because we don't get to see her, she was taken away. And um, the board usually is very heavy. They use a very thin metal wire 
on your neck. So you carry that board and you have to bend down also because the board is very heavy and the wire cut into your flesh. It's very, very painful. And at the same time, anybody can go there to kick you, beat you. Many, many people were dead on the spot. And uh, most uh, hurtful thing for professors was their students. They love very much. Many of you are professors. Just imagine, just one day you're like this. All your students there are beating you and say bad things about you, which are not true. And it's really, really hurtful and humiliating. And most people don't understand, didn't understand what happened. So suicide was daily event. I, that time I lived in the um, university campus. All the buildings above third floor, all the windows are uh, boarded to prevent people from jumping down to commit suicide. But still, people find ways to commit suicide. There are, I calculated, about 11 people in my family commit suicide. They couldn't understand what happened. What did I do wrong? The youngest person with my cousin, she was only 16 years old. And my favorite cousin, in his 20s, he started by supporting Mao's Cultural Revolution and condemned for some reason and put in prison. Of course, he's from our family, he's black, but he, didn't, he tried to prove his, he doesn't want to be black. And his mother first committed suicide by throwing herself in front of a train. His father was the uh, founder of a Sichuan Bank, their banking family. And he was put in prison. He didn't know what's, how to live his, the rest of his life. So he went on top of a very tall uh, chimney. And first he drank a lot of lime water and jumped from the chimney. So there's many people in my family commit suicide. But before, besides that, many was uh, starved to death or beaten to death. So that's what my mother faced every single day. And my father was a medical doctor. And uh, he, during the, um, a surgery uh, session, he was uh, just trying to find something to say to his fellow doctors and nurse, nurses during the surgery. He, was, he told a joke. Of course, after the surgery, the other per person turned him in. He was labeled anti-communist and uh, sentenced to prison. Later on, he told me when he heard that news, he first ran to find some blades and shave his head like my husband now, because uh, he said the f he, he knew the first thing they would do is grab your hair and pound it on the floor or to the wall. He said, I don't want to get the brain damage, so I shaved my head. And he was in prison and labor camp for a year, uh, was released because the prison was too full. Have no room for prisoners. And those, uh, those happen every day as a child. That's our amusement because we didn't have toys. We didn't have place to go. We didn't have schools. So every day I watch people putting, uh, was on the truck, uh, a truck, back of the truck with the big sign with the name with the red uh, cross on it and sent to uh, open fields not far from our house to get shot at. And um, just one example, what kind of people have a death penalty? One of my mom's uh, uh, classmates, he was uh, half Chinese, half Czech. And yeah, his mother is from Czech Republic and the uh, father was Chinese, so he doesn't look very Chinese. And uh, he 
His major was English, so he spoke foreign language. He doesn't look like Chinese, so he had the death penalty. Just like that, those people. And that's not, not a picture of me, but I did exactly the same at that age, at age 11. Our family were sent to the countryside from the city. Before that, uh, from 1966 to 69, we were in the city and going through all the humiliation and horror and, and fear. And um, earlier I said the, the, they put the big sign on these uh, professors and uh, not only openly humiliating them in the meetings, also forced them to march on the street, busy street, with a gun. And they have to chant, I'm so and so, I'm the enemy of the people, and list all the, all the bad names, the, um, those red guards give them. And uh, one day, uh, my brother and I, was uh, playing in front of the house, we heard a gun coming to our direction. We knew something's wrong. So here they come. My mother was followed by a crowd of her students forced to march to, towards us. What they want to do is to um, get my brother and I to confessed my parents educated us to uh, against communism. So they came to the front of our house, circled around, and forced my brother and I watch my mother being humiliated and told us, please tell us, what did your mom teach you what, uh, against the communism? Of course, my mom never did that. I, we had nothing to say. So my brother and I, we were just holding our hands, saying nothing. And then they start beating our mother in front of us, saying, now we proved. You, told, you, you taught your children to refuse the question of the Right guards, we have to watch. They're beating our mother there. As prisoners' kids, we tried very hard to not let people know my father was in prison, but everybody knew. So everywhere we went, people threw rocks at us and spit at us, saying, prisoners' kids, prisoners' kids, because they are entitled to do anything they want because we are not human beings. So finally, in 1969, we were sent to the very remote countryside. Actually, to us, it was a relief. We said, at least our family are together. We can die together. If we survive, we're together. So we didn't have a very um, bitterness. Of course, they took everything we had away our furniture, our clothes, and everything. We're allowed to bring one wood box as a possession, some, a couple, few pieces of clothes, and a little, I think, a, a pressure cooker we had, and uh, a sewing machine. My mom insisted. Actually, I insisted, because I knew I have to start making clothes for the family and the bicycle. Just a wood box about the size of this. And uh, we went and we start, that's what I start doing. We didn't have animals to till the land. So during that time, when we were tilling the land, actually let me put back there. And um, was under plant economy. That's my first taste of the horror of plant economy. Because 
Chairman Mao in a thousand miles away in Beijing decided our village is located to the south of Yangtze River have to plant rice and have to produce a certain amount of production because somebody fabricated some uh, number of uh, harvest. And so he said everybody, every farmer, every village have to do the same. But the land we had there was very clicky, hilly uh, landscape. It, does, it, didn't, um, it wasn't su suitable for plant rice. It's good for tobacco, peanuts, but government said those are cash crops. It's not allowed because those things you can sell on the market. So you have to plant rice. We had no water. We had to carry the water. The land is not producing. We're forcing the land to produce without any fertilizer. At the end of the year, the farmer put down more seed than they harvest. I, uh, interesting to see Reiner's uh, slides about rice farming in Indonesia. He said it's cheaper to buy rice here than in Indonesia. Actually, for us, we're rice producers. We had nothing to eat. The villagers there could only afford to eat solid rice one, one meal a day, Chinese New Year. The rest of the time, a big walk with a lot of water, with one handful of the rice in there to make some soup. And they just drank that soup. I remember I could count how many grains in the rice in that soup. At the end of the day, something left, we fed the pigs. The pigs are very, very skinny too. No private property allowed at all. So there's no vegetables. There's no market. So I found some uh, sidewalk places. I plant a few plants of um, hot pepper because it doesn't take much land. And a uh, couple of, um, I also sneak in a seed of uh, pumpkin. So I had some pumpkins and I had some chickens. So we're fine. My brother will go to the pond and get crab, uh, no, get the uh, snails and the uh, frogs. So that's why we ate everything. We, anything that didn't, uh, that didn't kill us, we ate it. I knew all the grass. When I walk, I always look at the grass because I knew which is edible, which is good, which is bitter. It became a habit of me already. And uh, so I... I didn't understand, but I knew something's wrong. I always thought in my, in my mind, how come Mao knows what we should plan? How come he tell us what to plan? I never had an economic class, but I knew plan economy is wrong. It's inhumane, it's totally, totally disaster. And also, I also learned in my head, equality is a very bad excuse. They use that to get rid of all the wealth in the nation, to make everybody equally poor. When uh, Ma Junjie's uh, slide there, 1962, China's poverty level is lower, lowest in the world, lower than the most African countries. I was there. I was starving. I was hungry. And uh, that's all because this government wants to replace God and command everybody's life. Command, and uh, in the very glorious slogan of uh, create equality. So I warn you, next time you think about equality, think twice, what are you really asking about? What is really in your mind? When you say equality, not fair, poor, rich, do not just say it without thinking. 
You've never been there, so you don't know what the poor people want. You don't know what starvation feel like. So uh, earlier, a lot of people asked me what is my profession, what I do, and why I do it. This is why. Now, 50 years, years later, China still wanting to go back. Not just wanting to go back, it's marching towards to the back. This is not 1966. This is 2016. And this song they're singing gave me nightmares. That's what we were singing. Mother's dear, father's dear, nobody more dear than the Communist Party. Chairman Mao is our salvation, our Messiah is more dear than our fathers and mothers. They're singing this again to today. And a Almost, Xi Jinping almost wants to change Chairman Mao to Chairman Xi. The slogans came back, Mao's quotation. This is also 19, uh, 2016 in the People's Hall in Beijing. And this is more horrifying. These two days, a lot of you talk about education. This is the education in China. Poor kids. Poor teacher, too. The teacher has to learn how to say it correctly. This is not just in China. It's everywhere, including Singapore, Mongolia, everywhere. I went, people want socialists, want equality, so-called equality. Wedding is no longer between two people. And they praise a couple at their wedding day. They said, instead of united, in their bedroom, they sit together, copy the manifesto of communism together for their wedding ceremony. That's why I have to tell my story. I have to go around the world to share because these are my life. I didn't learn it from books or movies. I lived through it. It was not very long ago. Me, live through it. It's real. It's horrible. I always, always remember four years ago, Dr. Sally said, the fight is not over. I copy him. The fight is not over. It's never over. If we don't wake up, we don't think, we just follow the good feeling of caring. Where are we going? And this is not just for us. I don't want my children, my grandchildren, to live the same life as I did. I don't want anybody in the world to experience the same life as I did. Today in North Korea, people are still living that life. And a lot of people envy it. How do I play this? This, this is just a, a one minute uh, video. You want to, if you want to watch the long version, you can go to Facebook or YouTube. Uh, 
I, for a while, uh, for many years, I didn't want to do any interviews. I didn't want to tell my stories. Why? Because the people who persecute us are still in power in China. Not like in Germany, hit after World War II, Hitler was condemned. Or Pol Pot in Cambodia was condemned. Those people oh. who, who were in power then, they were still in power now. So. When I tell my story, not just me, my family safety are in jeopardy. Well, and uh, so my parents don't know what I do. My brother doesn't know what I do. I cannot tell them. But this year, finally, I decided I have to tell the story. I cannot just hide behind the, the veil. So well, that's why I had this said, interview. God didn't make the world perfect. So men have to make it better. And men will definitely make it better. So, for example, as a um, communist soldier at a very young age, we were ordered to uh, kill all the birds in China because the birds will eat the crops and human beings will have less to eat. So we were um, put on the rooftop, on the, on the tree to make noise, so we won't let the birds rest. And uh, the birds were all eliminated that way and um, but the backfire in the the coming season the insects especially locusts just uh, all over China and destroyed all the crops and um, three years of uh, famine and uh, of course the government called it natural disaster but it was totally man-made disaster because because of No, I think, um, yeah, I, I can tell a lot of stories. You gave me three days, I can say three days. You gave me one week, I can talk about <laughs> one week. But this is just uh, just uh, um, a little bit. Uh, so I hope that um, you can um, uh, give you some idea. Communism is evil. Socialism is a disguise in communism. Right.